This product has not been pasteurized and therefore may contain harmful bacteria that can cause illness, particularly in children, the elderly, and persons with weakened immune systems, and in pregnant women can cause illness, miscarriage, or fetal death, or death of a newborn. Jesus. This week on Barbell Strug, my wildest dreams come true at Sweet Georgia Peas. <laughs> so good. Games. <laughs> Is it good? Pretty good, actually. Oh, wow. Yeah. Good, right? Yeah. Best, nice best warm milk, milk you've ever yeah. had. Yeah, like mother's milk. milk. Like mother's milk. So sweet. <laughs> I like it. You have it all over you. <laughs> Barbell Shrugged is brought to you by you. To learn more about how you can support the show, go to barbellshrugged.com and sign up for the newsletter. Welcome to Barbell Shrugged. I'm Mike Bletcher with Doug Larson, Chris Moore, and CTP behind the camera. We have traveled up to beautiful Vermont in, uh, what, what month is this, September? Probably the best time of year to be up here. And, uh, to, well, we're going to hang out with quite a few people, but we are here with uh, Joe P., as he goes by up here. Farmer Joe. We always just call Good him Farmer Joe. Uh, we're up here at Sweet Georgia Peas. This is a sustainable farm with, uh, you've got goats and plants. And <laughs> <laughs> farm stuff. I'm, I am what you might want, would call a, a city slicker, so <laughs> a lot of this is foreign to me. Uh, but I did get to taste uh, some of the best milk I've ever had in my entire life, since, since I was a child. You know, Spectacular. Since I was on the teat myself. That's right. <laughs> or if you listen to the audio version. Right, if you listen to the audio version, you missed out on the intro. You got to hop over to the website, check that out. I uh, I got a nice, I, I got the freshest milk you could probably we shut consume. you in the face. Unquestionable. Goat milk. Yes. Un- Slow motion. That's right. <laughs> yeah, uh, you know, on this show, uh, in the past, I, I've talked a, quite a bit about uh, myself consuming raw goat milk. I go to farmer's markets and I try to find stores that carry that type of thing depending on what state I'm in. Uh, it's uh, considered uh, illegal at a federal level. You can't cross state lines with the stuff or you're a felon. Uh, <laughs> they've raided farms over this stuff for people who have like actually transported over state lines. To say all this shit out loud is ridiculous. It, it, so- it sounds ridiculous. Downright scary, right? Yeah. Downright scary. You'd think that uh, we were trying to... Uh, we were like sneaking bombs across the border or something like that. May as well be. Yeah. So, um, so what we did this morning? Well, we're, it's perfectly legal since because uh, you're think, on the farm. We can do I'm anything we want on the farm with the raw milk products. Awesome. Uh, <clears throat> I guess that's kind of ridiculous, right? It's hugely ridiculous. What other What other ridiculous things do you have to work around? Like, um, so transportation of the raw products is because we try to feed the cities, right? We bring all our products down to Boston and New York. And transportation of the raw products, we can't do it. We have to abide by all federal guidelines to do uh, interstate shipping of of farm products. What does that mean? Uh, <laughs> to cross state lines, just to cross state lines. So we have to. Uh, so the raw products we cannot bring to the cities. Um, we can bring our eggs. We can bring meats that are processed in a USDA uh, processing facility, which we have one about forty minutes down the road. So that's not so bad. Yeah. Um, but I couldn't, as a small farmer, raise meat chickens on the farm, process them myself, and bring them down to Boston. That is also federally illegal. In regard to the raw milk, uh, what are some of the health benefits? I mean, a lot of people, you know, people, it's like uh, the laws are set up to scare people away from it, but I've heard a lot of stories of people having illnesses that actually almost get healed from the the raw milk. Yeah, so... um Obviously, it works different for everybody, depending on uh, there's, you know, however many billion people on the planet. So there's seven billion different diets that work for everybody. Right. But um, 
my opinion is raw milk is really the only milk that you can drink, right? Because once you process it, you're transforming this product into something that's just uh, got a longer shell life and more marketable to, to the people, but it's all a bunch of dead calories, right? So it might be yeah. more accurate to say that raw milk is the only thing you should call milk. That's correct. I actually had a debate with somebody recently that was debating almond milk was more beneficial than, <laughs> than raw milk. And um, Aren't you, you cute, know, That's right. That's right. Just because you call it milk doesn't mean it's milk. <laughs> That's right. Just because it's, it's white and conversation, milky conversation is over. You want almonds? You eat almonds. I've never, <laughs> milk, I've never milked milk. an almond in my life. <laughs> like, where, oh, hey, where's asshole. the teat on this almond? I can't find it anywhere. <laughs> this is you, ridiculous. We make some kind of offensive. If you want an almond, eat an almond. Oh, drink real milk. Yeah, the, the, problem, right. the problem with most processed food is that it turns into a whole lot of calories and not a whole lot of nutrients. And so having raw milk is calories plus nutrients and, and healthy bacteria and, and a whole host of other things. Pro I'm, I'm certainly not an expert on bacteria, right? Like everything, yeah. So. Mm -hmm. And then, then pasteurized milk is really just calories and all that stuff's basically been killed in the pasteurized process. Basically means they heat treat it and all that stuff dies. That's is correct. that right? That's correct, yes. I, I, I mean, I don't know how much of it's true, but I've heard uh, some pretty crazy stories about the the lack of standards or lack of I guess the standards that uh, pasteurized milk is he held to is is fairly low <laughs> and like if you were to like expose raw milk to the same uh, environment that you you expose un uh, pasteurized milk it would be you like if you learned exactly what everything that happened you would never want to drink milk from the store again that's correct pasteurized. that's You'd why they like, have to holy pasteurize holy shit it. they have to pasteurize this or else you would be poisoned to death. That's exactly right. So for the big companies to uh, to produce these foods, right, they have to pasteurize things because they need long shelf life. My milk lasts for like seven to ten days, you know. So it's virtually impossible to to mass market it on like a huge scale, you know. Mm -hmm. That's what that's the whole local community farm thing. That's where we come into that. Yeah, you shipping your milk to somewhere like Arizona would be impossible. They would, I mean, you could probably FedEx it or whatever, but it would make more sense for them to get it from Arizona, from their own local raw right. dairy. That's yeah. right. That's right. Yeah. So I know you're not a biochemist, but but what really d happens in this whole pasteurization process? Can do you know in detail kind of what happens there? Not really hugely versed on it because I don't do it. But mm -hmm. um, essentially, it's heated to I believe about 170 degrees for a series of minutes, maybe 15 ish. Mm -hmm. um, so there it, goes your probiotics and everything. That's right. It kills all the the potentially harmful bacteria, but it also kills all the good bacteria, all the good probiotics. You know? Is it fair to say there's a lot of the enzymes as mm -hmm. well? Is that true? I don't know. You don't know about that one? I'm, no. I'm not sure, but that sounds like something that yeah. potentially could happen. Yeah, I, I've heard that. Yeah. yeah. I mean, a lot of people who have, like, say, uh, they're lactose intolerant, a lot of times if they start drinking raw milk, they'll gain, it has the enzymes necessary for breaking down the lactose and other things like that. Sure, it makes a lot yeah. of sense, right? Yeah. I mean, A, I'm not really, you know, I'm a terrible salesman, so I'm not totally sold that human beings should be drinking milk at anyways, you know what I mean? But if we are drinking milk, we should certainly be drinking raw milk. And, yeah, they you know, not we're the only animals drinking milk as adults. Yeah, yeah, that's right. That's right. My experience. Another uh, species uh, Another species milk. Yeah, but I think this is one of the areas of diet where you could say, oh, I don't do good with dairy. But my next question is, what kind of dairy are you not being good? Because when I have cheap dairy or this, that, and the other, I feel a certain way. When I have the highest qualities, if mm -hmm. I have a, like, um, if you get a high quality goat kefir or something from a good source, even like Whole Foods is still pretty good. It's Absolutely. so much better than like keep the same kind of product just from a, a cow or the same kind of product from a bigger brand that is more industrialized. You can just immediately get an immediate sense that one is superior to the other. And you yeah. feel about an hour later, you feel that way too. No doubt about it. And I think not only with dairy, but you could bring that into the realm with everything, right? Like say eggs, you could bring that into the realm oh with God. produce. I mean, freshness, the factor of freshness is absolutely gigantic. Do you think what most people need to understand is that an egg is not an egg, a milk is not a milk? Uh, milk is not milk. Sorry, my grammar. It's early. <laughs> sorry, sorry. No, but like you know, those those. those so I, I won't eat eggs. I don't like them. You crack your egg in the morning and it runs all over the, the pan like water. The, 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 the yolk, yolk is just yellow. Breaks. Sure. Yeah. yeah. The yolk breaks. That is not like what you get on this farm. I, I imagine the the yolk is bright red and it holds up on its own. It's more like eating a little steak. Than it bright, is. bright orange. Yes. Yeah, bright, bright orange. orange what you after? Right. Red is danger. Red is uh, well. So a, a <laughs> little bit of oh, well. a little bit of bright red is okay. That's just a fertilized egg from the rooster. So that's all good. But um, yes, you you're absolutely right. A little extra umph in there. A little extra umph. <laughs> extra protein. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, correct. The eggs you buy in the supermarket are typically like you know three weeks old when you get them. You know we <sighs> we move. The, eggs here that are literally a day old we bring eggs to boston that are literally three days old never more than one week old when they reach our consumer 
Yeah. And it's oh. worth every penny you pay for the extra. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Every yeah. fucking And penny. is there any regulations on distributing the eggs? Uh, is there anything? They need to be kept at 42 degrees. So there's another mm-hmm. weird area. We're the only country in the world that refrigerates our eggs, but yeah. goes goes back yeah, to... Yeah, I, uh, yeah, I lived in Ireland and in Australia, and they didn't refrigerate That's right. Their eggs. No, you buy them right out on the shelf. Yeah, they yeah. sell them out and about. Like Doug and I, store. in college, would keep our, our eggs in the uh, cabinets. Yep. You know who told and me that? And then girls would come over to the house and be like, what is going on? I'm like, you don't have <laughs> to refrigerate I, eggs. When no, I live no. with Dr. Galpin, he, he called me out. like, why are you putting eggs in the fridge? I'm like, I don't know, asshole. Doesn't everybody put their eggs in the fridge? He's like, you don't need to do that. And he started going on an Andy rant. <laughs> well, you don't, want, <laughs> you don't want to go to the supermarket and take eggs out of, the unre- out of the refrigerator and then leave them out on your counter. You know. So what we do is we wash them. We should not wash our eggs. When we wash our eggs, they take off prof- protective layer that uh you know allows us to keep them out so it's after we wash them we take that layer off then they so do you have chicken shit on your egg that's okay that's right you want yeah. chicken shit on your eggs yes that's usually where <laughs> i eat most of my chicken shit is off the eggshell that's right <laughs> that's right. Yeah. that's right. and actually last last time we were here you were talking about how you want bugs on your vegetables too that's you want right to talk about that uh, sure i mean you know so essentially we we spray very little here we use pyrethrin all certified organic spray um but so, you know, if you have vegetables and they look perfect with no holes on them and there's no bugs eating them, you don't want to eat them either, I don't think, right? That, yeah. mean, that means if, if there's holes in the vegetables, then bugs have been on them eating the vegetables. And because there's bugs on it, it means they're not sprayed with a bunch of nasty-ass chemicals that you're eating instead? Safe assumption. Safe not, assumption. It's not poisonous. That's right. That's right. It's not poisonous. <laughs> that's so counterintuitive mm. what people think. Like, I want my leaves to be perfect and pristine because that's the highest quality. But yeah, if nothing else in the wild would eat it, you should avoid it because these animals are more in tune to what they need than, than you are. That's a fair assumption, right? These insects are going right towards what they need. That's right. Most animals are not going to commit suicide by eating something they can't it's eat. It's a bad know. strategy. That's right. Very bad life strategy. <laughs> so are the bugs not eating the vegetables because they can tell there's something bad on it, or are the, are the bugs dying because the chemicals are just sprayed on the bugs when they when the, when the the veggies get sprayed? The bugs are dying. The bugs are dying. So they're killing, mm-hmm. you know, all... And, you know, leads to another interesting topic, like with bees, right? You know what I mean? So they're killing the good bugs and they're killing the bad bugs. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, ladybugs, for instance, are like the biggest eradicators of aphids, which are a huge problem on small scale farms, you know. Uh, But when you're spraying anything, you're killing the ladybugs as well as killing the aphids. So it's the same thing going on with milk. Like the good bacteria in the bag, you crush it all. That's right. No survivor strategy. That's right. Yeah, a lot of people, they they may get sick at some time. They get put on antibiotics or something like that. It kills all the bacteria, the good bacteria as well in their mm-hmm. gut. And most people are never told, hey, you should go on like a probiotic. You know, they're eating processed food, and then they're never put on a probiotic regimen afterwards. And uh, it's really shocking to me. Like, I was like, everyone that's been on antibiotics at any time and hasn't gone, isn't drinking raw milk, isn't eating like raw vegetables that, that were, you know, grown in a, a farm like this, or aren't taking probiotics like intentionally, are probably set up. Their immune, uh, their immunity is is exposed. They're they're yeah, ready to get sick right over again. Metabolism and everything. Yeah, people get. Oh yeah, th- there's also yeah. They're finding a lot of things that have to do with metabolism. And if you don't have the right amount of probiotics in your gut, then yeah, now now you can't figure out why you can't lose that last bit of whatever. It's probably you're not, that you're it's not digesting all of your food. There's no money in healthy people, and there's no money in dead people, right? So. Matthew so, Barium. Sp- speaking of money, there's there's much easier ways to get filthy rich than to run a sustainable p- sustainable farm out here in Pittsfield, Vermont. I would have so. to think so. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> kind of like being a CrossFit gym owner. Say there's, Joe. Easy, <laughs> there's easier ways to make money than being a CrossFit gym owner, but most people do it because they're passionate about it and they love it, and that's and that's what I gather is why you're here. Hundred percent. It provides me the quality of life that I want to bring my children up in. You know, I work. Yeah. Seven days a week, 80 hours a day, uh, 80 hours a week, and uh, so I don't have to work 40 hours a week in the box. What time do you get here every morning, Joe? Uh, typically 6.30 to 7 a.m. It's not so bad. No, I could maybe so bad. follow you around for a week. Oh, I know accountants <laughs> that show up to the office before that. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Sure. When you come up here, you come around that corner at, you know, we got here, what, like, I don't know, it's, it's pretty early, and you see the sun coming over this mountain, and you, it's like laying sunlight on these, these plants, you walk through this facility, and you meet the people. I, I wouldn't have a problem getting up here to to do this this is a this is a place where passion is sort of running over it's, it's fucking gorgeous out here it's what? worth it isn't it absolutely w- worth every cent of it you know so and i have a four-year-old and a two-year-old that get to run around in these woods behind us you know and uh to be able to bring them up in this environment is is uh why i do it all we, we started this conversation earlier and ctp was like shut up <laughs> <laughs> <Never heard the laughs> podcast. And that tends to happen sometimes but uh you know i was talking about how you made the choice to leave 
was the city. That's right. At some point. Uh, how long ago was that? Uh, so my wife and I left the actual city eight years ago. We went to the suburbs of Boston and we came up to Vermont. Even worse. The yeah, suburb. T- totally. Yeah, the the, the worst thing America has created. Apologies if you're right now. <laughs> hey, asshole, I'm in the suburbs of Boston. <laughs> Sorry, man. <laughs> <laughs> we love leave, you. Leave. Yeah. <laughs> mediocracy. Follow you're like, you hot. You're settling for mediocrity in the suburbs, right? So give me extremes. Give me downtown cities or give me rural areas. And uh, yeah, yeah, I'm yeah. happier. That sounds like a revolutionary yeah, so statement. We, we were... Um, what we were talking is like I get hit up with people with questions all the time like how do you do it like because people will see what we do and it's pretty extraordinary what you're doing is very extraordinary and people are always asking you know it's like how do you do this and I was like well first you got to do this and like well I can't do this because I have this job that's right and I'm like the first thing like is people, no. pe- it's like it's like <laughs> it's like the job is off limits or something it's like well I can't lose all this weight you know I've got this job that really stresses me I'm like quit the fucking job you're like, dying quit. asshole it's like, it's you're like, dying what is your problem like the job is not the end all be all I promise it's like it, and it just drives me nuts it's like it's about lifestyle and your job is part of that lifestyle and that job does not serve your purpose that's right you gotta get out of there you're making choices every day you wake up you're making choices right yeah and so um Yes, you've got to get out of there. That's the best advice we could give anybody is get the hell out of the box. Yeah, get so, out of the so box. So how? Yes. <laughs> Everybody <laughs> out. Out. <laughs> I was going to say, what made it easier for you to make that leap? Like, how, how did you make it past the that big blockade to actually come out here and do this instead of whatever you were doing before? Um, so we were looking to expand our farm business down in south, southeastern Mass, and uh, it was virtually impossible uh, we met up with Joe and Courtney. We know Courtney from uh, a, a Joe lifetime DeSena. ago. Yep, Joe DeSena. We met up with them, uh, asking them about life up in Vermont, and their farm here just so happened to be empty at the time. And then he sold you pretty hard. He, <laughs> <laughs> I, so, I heard uh, he makes convincing arguments. He's a very good salesman, very good salesman. And uh, we were here three days. De- after the conversation started, we were here three days later, and we moved our entire operation three months after that. Wow. Yeah. Th- I mean, the, the possibilities here are just extraordinary. No regrets. No regrets. Oh my God! Not even d- a little bit. So, uh, how, how do you? Uh, are you raising your kids? How old are they again? Four and two. Four and two. Yeah. So, I mean, well, they're not at school age yet. Uh, they are not school age yet. No. Yeah. Well, uh, it's controversial. My four-year-old probably should be, according to some people, uh, entering preschool right now, but uh, she's not. Because they're not get, they're not learning shit out here. Jim. No, no, no. <laughs> I would definitely. We should put her under the fluorescent lights. Okay, we should put her under the fluorescent lights. Lock her in a box. No recess. Sit and, down. Uh, shut up. Be quiet. Right, right. Make marks on paper. That's right. And then we'll bring her to Walmart afterwards. Yeah. yeah. It's like <laughs> sit still for eight hours. Can't mm. can't figure out why so many children. Are obese in this country. I, I have no it's idea. A, oh, and 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 you gotta you get was it my buddy his uh <laughs> my buddy Rob he's on our team he uh was it the school the, water. the school it's a private school too won't feed the kid water they won't allow it has it. to drink milk because that's federal regulation milk? there's some like what? federal law that says they have to feed them this milk he has a good dead ad- milk yeah. He has a good probably doctor's skim note. milk, right? Right, right. hood, it, it, actually hood milk. I'm assuming, right? What's hood milk? It hood got a brand, the big dairy industry in America. Yeah, right. some, you some, don't know. You don't know about that. I guess some <laughs> some dairy lobbyist <laughs> figured out how to get water out of the schools, so that he's like, look, my kid's like four years old. Just just feed him water. He's like That's humans. Right. And the, the, humans he drink has water. To get a do- he has to get a doctor's note. <laughs> Are to, you serious? To get the kid fed water instead of milk at, at a meal. This is not this is not fallacy. This is fucking happening. That's and it's probably outrageous. happening all over the and place. And this is in That's Tennessee. Right. It's not like uh, New York City where people are insane. Right. But uh, <laughs> now you've offended fucking all those people. <laughs> well, the politicians there. We we know. Anybody I mean, else in large metropolitan areas you want to piss off? <laughs> <laughs> <and> exclude. <laughs> <laughs> well, Joe, I I also have. I've got a now a, a little boy who's coming up on three. He turns three next month. I've sure. got a little girl now. Awesome. She's five months old. What do what does the average parent who's like, you know, because when last time Zach was here with us, his main concern is now something I'm echoing, where I'm starting to get more and more freaked out that my fucking kids aren't getting anything out of the food. In fact, they may be actively poisoned by this. What, what do kids need to under? What, what are some good guidelines that kids can, can start learning, something simple that can help them start understanding the role of food in their life? That's a tough question and a huge problem, obviously. Um, the easy, the easiest way to put it is, again, you're making choices. Everything you put in your body, you're either feeding disease or you're fighting it, right? And so we need to teach our kids that. You're either feeding disease. Everything you're putting in your body, you're feeding disease or fighting it. And uh, that's probably the easiest 
most straightforward way to I put it. I think kids would understand the, the, the idea that you just don't eat because this is something you do and it makes your tummy feel satisfied. You are you're a machine and then just like daddy has to put fuel in his car, you know, that's you, right. have to, you have to fuuel your body. And that's if you right. don't fuel it, like you remember that time that that Uncle Mike forgot to get gas on a road trip like for the fifth time <laughs> and we ran out of gas. That's, that'll happen to your body. That's exactly right. <laughs> all right, all right. It happened your one time and out. now it's, we're up to five. Five times. <laughs> uh, by the way, so <laughs> this sign that I read er, right at the beginning of the uh, podcast, uh, when you first brought this out, we were saying, hey, man, this would be a really great way to intro the show because it's really ridiculous. <laughs> it's something they that's put so baby healthy. death on there twice. Well, three times. <laughs> like, how many, how many, you can have a miscarriage or fetal death. Or death of a newborn. If, if, if you're not convinced that the government propaganda. is uh, using like fear tactics, that's a huge, <laughs> hugely <laughs> popular. Sign, man. That's right. I, it, before anybody buys any raw goat's milk, I have to make sure that they read that sign. Federally regulated. Does that oh, seem fair? Man. What about Red Bull? What about? Uh, exactly. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I shouldn't probably. Yeah. No. Uh, go for it. <laughs> now that's the thing is, <laughs> and what, you, what you had said. <laughs> what you had said is like this is the warning label that should be on Mountain Dew. That's right. Not on raw milk or this monster energy just, drink right. you know any of these drinks that are going to kill you no doubt about it yes raw milk may kill you it's potential anything but you know mountain dew 95 percent of the stuff that's in the grocery store is ki- have that is label. killing you yeah. you're, you're right i yeah. get so tired people are like, but there's bacteria all over the milk there's bacteria all over you asshole if you're lucky that's right <laughs> Quit using that stupid fucking soap you're always washing yourself with and stuff I mean, <laughs> you allow yourself to be as you are you should be mostly bacteria your body is like 80 percent right bacteria. your weight is mostly Bacteria, get the fuck and over the bacteria. And you spend your whole life trying to <laughs> kill it off. Is Vermont into the whole no soap, no no poo, no shampoo movement, where you just you're just washing yourself with water and basically nothing else, uh, or, or making your own concoctions? So yeah, sure, lots of people do that. I use bar soap, right? Like I use Dove bar soap because I'm not an asshole. You know, that's, that's, <laughs> that's what I do. Uh, as far as say deodorants and stuff, I didn't use deodorant in seven years. You know, so um, I think mm-hmm. so. In this circle, I don't use soap. Doug doesn't use soap. Mm-hmm. Chris, are you off no, the soap yet? Uh, let me. I have switched to. I don't know if this is any better, but I got off of Amazon like a. It's like coconut and uh, palm oil and also seaweed soap. It's, but it seems better in my mind. It's, <laughs> it's, it seems like it's healthy. The ingredient. The ingredient li- list is certainly there for you. It's only got, it's a, that's all it's in it. It's like seaweed, coconut, and and palm Interesting. oil. Yeah, that's all it is. Yeah, I, I, I only use soap if I feel like there's a real need. If I'm fucking right. covered in oh, a, yeah. actual like dirt or whatever, like where I can like see their stuff on me, then then I'll use soap. You know, but I, actually, if I'm just you, sweaty from a workout, then I like actually to feel use, sexy. That's I use, me. I actually keep that clean snatch soap um, on hand for like if I get tattooed. Like if I end up with you know, if I have a wound or mm-hmm. or uh, yeah, right. I'm, I did jujitsu. I grapple. And I'm covered. Yeah, I grapple. Yeah, I use soap. Like, now I'm <laughs> now it's like all right, time to kill this bacteria. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, outside of that, like I, I don't use soap at all. Uh, but yeah, just going you know further on the bacteria front because we're talking about like gut bacteria. But then back in January, I heard a guy talk about uh, like bacteria on your skin. I was like, shit, that's really no different than the bacteria in your gut. No, and no. Uh, and I was like, all right, I'm gonna, and he convinced me to do otherwise. So. It's basically your defense against the environment to a large degree. My wife doesn't complain about my smell at all. So nope, nope. Yeah. My well, wife smells right. as good as I do. So yeah. you know, that's all that matters. Uh, <laughs> as, long, as long as you match. <laughs> it's like it's like we're totally happy. I mean, pe- you know, crowds dissipate when we arrive. <laughs> that's but, right. You know, that's right. Totally cool. But we can all hang out with each other, you know, and we don't mind. So it's yeah. good. Let's take a break real quick, and uh, when we come back, we're gonna. I don't know what we're gonna do this time. You got any good we're, ideas? We're gonna make Joe spill all the secrets. Oh, all the secrets. The secret secrets. You know those we talked about that people are gonna love if they <laughs> stay oh, tuned. Oh yeah, those secrets. Yeah, those secrets. <laughs> Welcome back to Technique Wad. Today we're talking about strengthening your rotator cuff so you can prevent injuries and be way stronger overhead. So a common pattern that we see with especially new people when they get into lifting weights is that they do a whole lot of pressing and they don't do as much pulling. So I might do a lot of push-ups, a lot of bench press, uh, maybe even some overhead work, um, you know, standing barbell presses, dumbbell presses, kettlebell presses, and I don't match my pressing with equal amounts of pulling. I don't do as many ring rows, strict pull-ups, barbell rows um, in equal proportions to the amount of pressing that I do. I want to match one-to-one usually pressing and pulling. And that's not a very common thing to see amongst beginners uh, until you um, get more experience and you start to learn more about the pulling exercises, which certainly aren't as popular. You know, bench press is talked about much more than, than barbell bent over rows. So because the popularity of bench press is way higher than barbell bent over rows, 
people will do way more bench presses and not as, uh, as many barbell bent rows. And so what happens is you get some type of an imbalance, your pressing muscles get strong, your pulling muscles, um, you know, they're way behind and it takes a long time to get those pulling muscles to catch up. So that's a very common thing. If you've been training in a CrossFit gym or you have some amount of strength and conditioning experience, you probably already know to, to get that roughly, that one-to-one -one ratio between pressing and pulling. If you did pressing for a long time and now you're just learning about pulling and you're just trying to catch up uh, your pulling volume to your old pressing volume, then maybe you do twice as much pulling right now as you do pressing. You have a two-to-one ratio of pulling to pressing just so you can catch up and get some amount of uh, balance back in your body. So that's a very common thing. Another really common thing is that with pressing and pulling, since your pec is a shoulder internal rotator and your lats, your big back muscles, are also internal rotators, um, often doing a lot of pressing and pulling with the two examples I just used with bench press and with barbell bent rows, those are both internal rotation based activities since I'm using primarily uh, at the shoulder here my pecs and my lats. So because I do a lot of internal rotation, I rarely match or you probably don't have to do one-to-one, -one, but you should do some amount of supplementary external rotation work. That way your rotator cuff can stay nice and strong. So if you don't know what a rotator cuff is, uh, I'm going to have Mike come out here for a second. This is Mike Knowlton, he's one of our coaches here at Faction. If he faces this way, basically what your rotator cuff is, is a series of four different muscles that float on your scapula and go out to your shoulder, or rather to your upper arm, your humerus. So if my shoulder blades are here, just so you can get a picture of this, if Mike raises his arms up overhead, my shoulder blades kind of float up like that, and then when he goes back down to normal, they float back down together. If he rolls his shoulders forward, you know, they'll float out to the side. If he brings them together, they'll come out like that, okay? So if I, if I use this hand on his right scapula here, your rotator cuff, again, is four different muscles. There's two muscles, one here and one right below it. This is your infraspinatus, and this is your teres minor. And they basically wrap over the shoulder like this. So when these muscles contract, they're going to contract this way. And as they contract this way, they're going to pull him into external rotation. As they relax, he's going to kind of go back down the other way. Okay? So those are your, your rotator cuffs external rotator muscles, those ones are often, often left a little bit weak for a lot of people that don't train um, to actually make them stronger. They kind of neglect them and then they get weaker over time in comparison to all the other muscles that are internal rotation based. Okay? So those are going to be the muscles we focus on today, those muscles that are kind of right here that wrap around the shoulder. Okay? Now just to round out this big picture of, the, um, of your rotator cuff, there's another muscle that runs right here that kind of goes right over the top. And so when it contracts and it shortens here, if he just relaxes, relax, when this shortens, it kind of raises his arm up just like this. And then finally, the last one, if my rotator cut or my scapula rather is here, it's on the underside. And then what it does is it sneaks from the underside here and it wraps under like this. And so when it contracts, it pulls down like that and it internally rotates um, Mike's arm in this case. So if I have a shoulder, bl a shoulder blade right here, I have muscles on top and muscles on bottom, and really what they're doing, if you actually we come around this side, really what they're doing is some are sneaking around underneath like this, and some are sneaking over the top like that, and then you can see those muscles are hugging the top of his humerus, and it's basically, I'm gonna hug you, it's basically pulling the top of his arm into his shoulder like this, that way his, his upper arm, and his, or his whole arm rather, doesn't fall off of his shoulder blade, because if, if it has this very small socket, where the, the head of his humerus is, is sitting right there and it rotates around in that socket like that, it can easily just kind of slip off, right? Because it's not, it's not wrapped around. There's no bone wrapped over this bone like in your hip. Like your hip's like this where like there's bone over your leg bone. But your shoulder's not like that at all. It's like, it's like a golf ball on a golf tee, okay? It's not, it's not really in there, it's, mus it's muscles and ligaments and your joint capsule and tendons that are holding it on there and it easily can slip off if your rotator cuff um, isn't actively pulling um, and keeping it on your shoulder blade. Okay? So that's kind of what your shoulder blade looks like. So again, for the rest of this technique wad, we're going to show you exercises to make these two muscles right on top that wrap over the top here that help pull you into external, ro into external rotation. We're going to make those muscles stronger, that way you have more balanced for your rotator cuff. All right, so here's a few exercises you can do 
um, either doing your warm up or probably at the end of your workouts. Uh, for the most part, you're not going to go to failure. You're just trying to get those muscles to, to activate, so to speak, and to get a little bit stronger. But fatiguing them 100% all the way to failure uh, generally is not that good of an idea because it's going to help you, or not, not help you, but rather cause you to lose some amount of stability in your shoulder. So maybe if you're about to take a couple days off, you can, you can go to failure. But for the most part, especially if you're going to work out you know, another time that day, if you're doing doubles, uh, or if you're going to some type of sports practice or whatnot, you don't want to have a totally 100% fatigued rotator cuff because it's going gonna, it's gonna to make your shoulder unstable and it's going to make you more likely to get injured. So if you're going to go to failure, you need a big window of rest on the order of you know, at least 24 hours, preferably more, uh, maybe up to 48 hours uh, if you're going to go all the way to failure. So for the most part, the exercises look like this. They're all face pull based. So a face pull is anytime you pull something towards your face like that. So if you have cool crossover symmetry bands, which are getting more popular now, you can just get some tension. Generally, we put them a little bit low, you know, waist height or knee height, and then you're basically pulling right up towards your face. Okay, almost like you're going to this like bodybuilder double bu double biceps position like this. So I'm not just pulling my elbows back like this because I'm internally rotated right now. This is externally rotated. This is internally rotated. So I'm not just pulling here, although there is one type of face pull. I want to make sure I pull my shoulder blades together and then I externally rotate, which means my hands go back as far as I can get them. Okay. So I'm pulling here. Again, I'm not here. I'm up like this. My elbows aren't way behind me where I'm like this. My elbows, my hands are right around the same, you know, in the same plane, so to speak. So an easy way to see where that's going to be. So you put your hands out just like this and you bring your hands in where you're basically touching your fingers to your ears. That's where you're going to be. If you can't touch your ears, then you're not actually rotated all the way. Okay. So it's an easy way to think about that. And there's, there's many different variations you can do with the crossover symmetry bands. I'm not going to go over all of them, though. This is the general idea. If you don't have crossover symmetry bands, what I like to do is just take, you know, take two bands, just tie one on totally normal, and then grab the other one and put it in there. Usually I kind of just shake it to get it, to get it even. And then what I do is I put my thumb in like this, put my thumbs in like that, and then I grab around like this. And then same thing, I step back, shoulders together, hands come all the way back to my ears, and then I'm pulling like this. Okay. Uh, if you don't have any bands at all and you want to use um, small plates, you can just grab you know, a two and a half or a five pound plate, and then basically you're you're just going to bend over, you know, nice straight back, shoulders back, neutral spine, same thing. I'm just going to pull the plates up to my ears just like this. Okay. And again, there's a million different variations. A million different variations with each one of those things that you potentially could do. Uh, for this video, I'm going to keep it as, as simple as possible and just show you those three. Um, but a quick caveat before we end. So we're trying with, with these movements to uh, work on pulling, you know, scapular retraction, and then also with external rotation in that face pull position. So that kind of kills two birds with one stone. It helps with your, your pulling strength and your, your scapular stability strength, and it also helps with your, your rotator cuff external rotation strength. So overall, it's going to help make your shoulders healthier. You're going to be less likely to get injured. You're going to be stronger overhead or just stronger with your upper body in general, uh, especially you know, being on the rings in an unstable environment. Having a stronger rotator cuff makes you much more sta stable, excuse me, so when you're on the rings, you're less shaky and you're, you're very solid on the rings. Okay? That being said, your rotator cuff is not the only thing to consider if you have some type of shoulder injury uh, or if you're trying to get your shoulder stronger. For the most part, if we go from, from kind of core to periphery, starting with our spine, we always want to have Instead of a rounded over upper back, we want to get more thoracic extension by doing you know, extensions over a foam roller or over a barbell, some type of thoracic extension. And then from there, we want to work on having um, stable shoulder blades. That way, you know, when I reach overhead, my shoulder blades upwardly rotate all the way. 
Usually the limiter with that is, is lower trap strength. Go Google that. Go Google lower trap activation exercises or lower trap strength or scapular stability strength. And you can see exercises on that. Maybe we'll do some technique wads on that in the future. Uh, and then on top of that, you wanna make sure that you have adequate mobility at your actual shoulder joint. Do you have all the shoulder flexion you need overhead? Do you have full external rotation? Do you have full internal rotation? You know, can you, can you reach up can you reach up and you know, touch your opposite, uh, your opposite shoulder blade? Things like that. So there's all kinds of assessments for um, getting or having and testing to see if you have enough mobility in your shoulders and the whole rest of your body. Uh, certainly we have maximum mobility, which is designed to do that exact thing. So if you want to test your mobility, you're welcome to look into maximum mobility. But the whole point of this conversation right now is that uh, working your rotator cuff and making your rotator cuff stronger it is important, but it's only a, a small piece of the big picture. So if you have a, a hurt shoulder, you definitely should incorporate some type of face pull or external rotation based strengthening exercise routine into your, uh, into your workouts, into your warmups, and maybe into your, your, post, uh, your post workout or your end of the workout, uh, you know, the little stuff you do just to kind of um, you know, keep good maintenance on, on little things where you're done with your squats, you're, you're done with your Metcon, you do some external rotation work, you do, if you want to do some, some abs or something, you do some abs or something. It's like the little stuff you do at the end. It's a small piece of the big picture. So, so incorporate this stuff in your warm-ups, but if you already have a shoulder injury, then be sure to get that checked out and find out if there's any other uh, deeper underlying problems that are more important than just fixing your rotator cuff. So uh, if you want more videos like this one, you can go to barbellshrug.com. Uh, click on Technique Wad. Uh, if you go to the Episodes tab at the top of the page, there'll be Technique Wad. Uh, in the drop down menu. Uh, click on that, all the episodes are in the library. Uh, if you want us to do a cool technique wad on something that we haven't done one yet, um, click on ask a question, which is in the top right corner of the website. And there, uh, one of those questions is what technique, wad, what technique wads would you like to see in the future? And uh, if we like what you have to say, then maybe we can do a technique wad on exactly what you want in the future. I'll see you another day. And we're back with Joe P, AKA Joe the Farmer. Uh, we're up here talking about sustainable farming, uh, things you should know about the food you're eating. The evils of government propaganda, fuck them. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well said. <laughs> as, as things become more transparent, people's eyes are being opened. Uh, and that's one of the things we're trying to do here. It's great. <laughs> uh, we want to talk about CSAs. Well, two things. Uh, we'll talk about CSAs because that's how people can get involved and how they can get a hold of the, these types of foods. Can you inform us? Tell us about CSAs and how people can get started. Okay, yeah. So uh, CSA is Community Supported Agriculture. Uh, find the local farm in your area, the local CSA farm in your area, and sign up for a 20-week program. They probably do. That's what we do. Some farms do 10 weeks. Some farms do whole year-long programs, depending on where you're at. And it is a guaranteed way for you to get their produce and their meats and their eggs delivered directly to you or you may have to go and pick it up at a farm stand you know in your town but that is the most important thing we can do be buying from small farms all across america and maybe we will change things around a lot of times they'll deliver straight to a crossfit gym we, we've had that in the past yeah, where, that's where right. we would the like saturday morning they would come with a big delivery with a bunch of coolers and they would just drop it off at our gym and people would just come train pick it up people that didn't train at our gym they could come pick it up there too it's exactly what we do we it's do. not expensive mountain strength mm. crossfit well, winchester yeah. yeah 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 okay so what do you what do you say to people who are like oh, i would love i don't have the money for this joe i can't afford to have that csa thing brought to the gym every week let's see it CSA what is that like cheaper than whole foods first I, off no I, but people this is what people say this is what fucking people say about it it's that 100 percent. You're, you're absolutely right uh so if you broke down most csa shares they will be cheaper than going to whole foods or anywhere any grocery store and buying produce uh unless of course you're buying the completely terrible produce mm -hmm. then you you, you, know, you might be if you're buying you know, bottom of the barrel at walmart that's you right might you might get away with a little bit cheaper food however what you're eating isn't going to do anything for you. That's so exactly that's right. That's point one. It's not too expensive. Just do the math for yourself. And point two would be, if you're somebody who's interested in performance and you're looking for ways to do it and you currently have a shelf full of fucking bullshit and bottles and jugs and, and all this powdered shit, like I'm talking about supplements, <laughs> until you put your money... I'm, 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 I'm saying, go for it, Until yeah. you fucking put your money in real food in places like this, until you 
eat this and understand the kind of benefit that has to your physiology and your fucking emotional well-being and your performance and everything. Until you do that, take the money out of your fucking cabinet and put it in the pocket of somebody like Joe, and that can make you fucking feel better. Yeah. That's what I would say to Try. you. Try so, it for one fucking cycle. Do it. See how good you feel. <laughs> so you guys are in the middle of Vermont, Sorry. in Pittsfield, Vermont. <laughs> Max F-bombs <laughs> <and, laughs> in, in one minute. Yeah, right. I'm fired up, Joe. No, I, I love it. I love it. Joe doesn't carry some Boston. That's right. <laughs> Fuck it. So be, be, because you guys deliver... Because you guys deliver real food and it has a short shelf life because it's real food, yes, um, you probably can't deliver all over the world. You have to deliver to a, a semi-local area. The whole local farming movement That's right. delivers to the local area. So how far do you guys deliver outside of Pittsfield? So we, uh, we last winter found ourselves uh, asking ourselves a big question. What actually is local, right? That's the big problem. And the congressional definition of local is 400 miles. So we created this mm. graphic, uh, which we are basically at the hub of, and drew a circle and so none of so we also partner with other farms right like we bring other farm stuff down into the cities as well so none of any of the food that we delivers travels over 400 miles but mm-hmm. and most of it really travels like 150 miles so if someone just got on google and they they googled pittsfield and it was less than 400 miles then more than likely you can help them out uh yes 100 percent. uh as long as they have a group of people and you know it's really hard for us to say one person yeah i can deliver right. this and it's 100 miles away from everybody else so mm-hmm. typically what we try to do is groups of 10 to 20 people you know and you mentioned crossfit gyms like we partnered with a couple of them in mass mm-hmm. uh crossfit magnitude and pembroke and mountain up, strength guys? crossfit in Cheers. winchester yeah nice and, and we literally pull up there uh we'll be there tomorrow and we pull up there with coolers in our refrigerator truck and drop off a bunch of food and after oh, your workout, you bring it right home. We're okay. gonna have to come do a delivery with you one day. Let's, yeah, it'd be great, yeah, man. We'll, we'll come great. back probably six months from now. <laughs> we wear our delivery outfits. And I'm in Vermont every six months now. And, okay, uh, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll we'll schedule it where we'll, we'll uh, do the drop. That guy with the beard right. from that thing brought us our food this morning. <laughs> <laughs> and and that's not a pain in the ass for the gym owner. It's not like you're charging the gym owner to like make that drop off location. No, we give like the that. gym owners free food to, for letting us drop the food there. Hey, to be my honest, my CSA didn't do that. Well, <laughs> hey, for all you cro- all you CrossFitters in the Boston area. Area. We give you free food if we can drop off at your gym. Do you need oh, any other shit? That's a selling it? point right no, there. That's good, right? Because that's most good. gym owners are poor. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> and, and most farmers, too. All right. <laughs> Sign up, folks. Yeah, so that's two parts, too. Like, So we were talking about, like, more than likely you do have money to buy good, healthy food. When I was in college, my grocery bill, when I told people what it was, they were like, what? It's like, it's like, it's like, or, you know, and when I was first starting the gym, it was like, I only make... X amount of dollars. I was spending close to fifty percent of my income on sure. my food because that's how much I value. Because it's a lifetime value thing. Like you're have, gonna live longer, healthier. You're have less you, pri- to get have you cancer. priced cancer lately? Right. right. That's, yeah. that's the big question. Expensive. Have you priced cancer lately? Or if you're a college student, how much money every week is going towards beer? Yeah, right. it's like, it's like yeah, the the kids who are like, <laughs> oh yeah, you know, they spend two hundred bucks a month on supplements, and then they have. Two to three hundred dollars in bar tabs, and, go, and they can't me. afford right. healthy food. That's it's right. like, oh. and you're typing your history one hundred and one paper on a fucking three thousand dollar new laptop. I think you got money <laughs> for food. Don't be a dick. Yes. <laughs> well, the other thing too on the money side of things is the things you spend money on are what decides what happens in the world. And if you want to see a world where like healthy food is cheaper, you have there has to be more volume being done. Uh, simple supply and demand. Simple economics is if we have more people. Uh, demanding that these things be produced and the supply side will come in and then the the price is going to drop. And so, like, if we can just, you know, bite the bullet now, spend a little more money now, and we can get other people to come in. And this is where, like, getting CrossFit gyms to partner with these farms is really important because if we can really uh, get people to buy more of this stuff, not even just from a nutritional aspect, but from a just, like, let's make the world a better place because your farm it doesn't do nearly as much damage to the earth right. as a lot of these other farms. These farms where they're like tilling up tons of land, where they're where they have these CAFOs, where they're taking cows and just like feeding them till they're almost dead, then slaughtering them. These these are very polluted environments, and most farms are polluting the environment, whereas your farm also is actually ocean. healing the land, and that's a huge piece. That's something I think about a lot, and that's one of the reasons I want to get into sustainable farming uh, one day is because you know not only is it nutritionally better. It's better for everybody's health, but it's also just better for the land. It's not I just really land, think, it's ocean too. Look I at really the fucking dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico. 100% right. I, yeah, you're I really 100%. think a lot of the droughts we're having out west is due to just, you know, 50 years of bad farming Because practices. we're allowing it. We are allowing this shit to go down. We're by driving it. We're and, driving yeah. the goddamn bus, you know, yeah. and it's insane, right? you got to put the money in the pockets of the right people to change things around a little Absolutely. bit. Absolutely. There, there okay. are good organizations. We, we talked about, like, 
not every big corporate entity is doing bad. Like Whole Foods is doing, trying their best. They're doing, a, support, they're doing a great. If job, they know right. that more and more people are rising to this, they can put their money behind the movement. That's right. Very easily. Yeah. That's right. And unfortunately, the government kind of had the laws are kind of set up in the favor of the big corporate farmers no. kind of destroying the land. <laughs> Joe's like, what are you talking and, about? And, and what's really, and so not only are the like the tax, I mean, they're, they're subsidized. That's so, right. So, so Simply put, they don't pay as much taxes and they and they actually get money and we, from the government. Not, that's right. Yeah. Their money gets, their farming gets paid for. We have to pay to be certified organic, right? Right. Which is now starting, the subsidies are starting to come our way as well to, uh, you know, reimburse for the organic certification and the yearly dues and all that stuff. But uh, that is the truth absolute truth is wall street starting to believe in us and right. the government is starting to turn around and you know the government just bought up usda so it's like um you know they're they're going our way but we, we just got to keep that train going you know Take yeah and then, battle, so, sorry, so some of these subsidies and things like that are are against you but there's also some laws that are you know people are being you know uh, farmers are being uh prosecuted Mm-hmm. Um, for you know things like selling you know raw milk or crossing state lines or something like that. That's right. So there's a. Do you know about the Legal Defense Fund? There's a. There's like a lo- What's it called? Can't remember what it is. Rob Wolf is really big on oh. it. Um, you should if anyone's like really passionate about this specifically, you should check out his website. I think he's got a link there. We'll make sure to there's publicize like a, this. There's yeah. like a legal. Yeah, we'll put it on our blog. We'll put a link. But there's a legal defense fund for farmers who get in some kind of trouble. Oh, it's really you know? cool. That's yeah. Cool. So there is something out there for that. Hopefully, I will not have to use the legal defense fund. But you never know. If, if, if you ever, ever get in trouble, we're gonna swoop in with cameras. Ah, that's <laughs> awesome, man. It. That's yeah. sweet. I'm <laughs> so happy to have you guys on my back. <laughs> <laughs> so, do you have any advice for anyone that that wants to potentially start their own farm someday, even if they're starting on a super small scale? Um, yeah, just go for it. That's what we did, right? We we started with. <laughs> there you go, man. That's Fucking right. Go for it. That's it. Uh, you're gonna fuck up, but you'll learn. And you'll make your farm work, right? You're right. Everybody fucks up with everything they do. I don't care if you're sitting in the box. You fuck up every day, right? So, um. Basically, we bought three goats and 25 chickens and started planting some seeds. And now we have 29 goats and 200 chickens, and we're growing produce on four acres. Oh, so, yeah, like seven years later, you know, so well, hopefully you just got to go for it. By the time the show airs and a little bit of time goes by, you'll have like fucking 500 goats over there. And 500 chickens. Not chickens. going for 500 okay. goats. Right? I don't know. I'm Jesus. not a farmer. I don't know <laughs> what you're talking about. That's right. That's I'm just good. communicating that I hope things grow. Uh, <laughs> last night, we were, so we were invited, we were, we're traveling all over the place. We were invited up here by Joe DeSina. And we were at a function last night up in a barn. Yes, not, we were. not the type of barn you may be thinking of. And it's, we didn't know a, what it was, and we were we, surprised. We, we like walk in eight o'clock at night. Like, what's going on? They're like, was this a wedding or something? Sit down. <laughs> we're having dinner. It's like this formal dinner. I'm like, I am in gym clothes. <laughs> right. Entire. So I had goat shit on my boots, so it's all good. <laughs> so we walk in. There's a lot of authors. There's a lot of entrepreneurs. There's a lot of like activists Google all in this room. And and, and everyone uh, there was uh, the the four three one project, mm-hmm. uh, which is uh, I'm. I wasn't here for the entire weekend. I, I basically showed up for the ass end of the trip. Right so, on. like, I don't know exactly what was going on. Uh, but I, I kind of put the pieces together. Uh, it's about solving the child obesity problem. And, obesity and, and diabetes, people, yes. Keeping kids off the couch, get them out doing physical activity. That's right. I think one of the large taglines is that for uh, the first time in human history, our children's life expectancy is less than ours. That is, that's just not acceptable. Man. That's not acceptable. That's bro. fucking bull. Yeah, that's right. That doesn't jostle mm-hmm. you into action. What does? That's right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and so uh, what's the website? Is it just 431project? 431project.com, I believe. Okay. I yeah, believe. we'll uh, we'll also post that to yeah, the website. Absolutely. Yeah, there's a lot of people hitting it from a lot of different angles. There's authors there. There's uh, guys like Ben Greenfield, who we've had on a podcast before. Uh, Joe is basically leading that up. Uh, not only are they trying to you know improve like uh, uh, kids just – getting exercise but nutrition and looking at the education system like basically they he invited 100 people in the room that can hit it from every single angle if we can hit it from every single angle maybe we can uh, make a big difference what i also like right. about that event is that there's a people who are <clears throat> look here's the bottom line about joe there's a room full of people saying they're gonna change the world normally it'd be like cool man like let me know how it goes i'll, I'll cheer for you maybe i'll share your post but in this room i believe that that's gonna happen i do not put anything past joe and then also in that room were stories of how it can happen. Like that, my highlight was that guy got up, normal looking guy, looks like a normal crossfit, look muscular, bald guy, you know the one I'm talking about. He gets up and tells a story. I go, oh yeah, he seems like he's really like really passionate about whatever he's gonna say. And he goes, yeah, I just want to say that Nick, I used to be 500 pounds and I'm, 500 I'm pounds. he used to be 500 pounds. And now he's probably he looks like he's 225, two two maybe he's he's 230. He's I talked dropped, to him last night. 230. So yeah. he's down from 500. 
And he just said, look, I, I want to say thank you because I'm living proof of what kind of change you can make. If you just listen to these simplest things, your whole life can just be totally revolutionized. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. It's totally revolutionized, totally better. You're not, you know, you can feel so much better. You know, it's, it's so simple, yet we are taught not to do it, to live the other way. I don't, I don't understand. Well, everyone, exactly everyone wants a complex that's right. solution to it, what <laughs> right. they perceive as a complex problem. Listen, yeah. get outside, eat real food. And you will live a longer, healthier life. And you'll also be stronger and Boom. Fatter, That's right, and right? happier uh, and very simple. sexier. No, knowledge bomb drop. <laughs> very simple. Yeah. So for kids that, that really don't understand that they're going to you know, be obese and become diabetic and, and get some type of long-term chronic disease that's going to be you know, digging themselves into a very deep hole it's hard to get out of, mm-hmm. how, do you, how do you get them to understand the importance of, of exercising and, and, and eating well? And I know you're not like an expert on kids, kids' fitness and nutrition whatever, but... But do you have any any perspective on that, having kids yourself and working w- with Joe on this 431 project? Yeah, so, I mean, the best advice I can give is find other uh, – so it starts with the parents, obviously, right? And um, you need to put your kids in the right environment, like, and that's mm-hmm. exactly what I've done. So, um, you know, it's really hard for, for these inner-city kids that they're given zero options and their parents, you know, don't educate them otherwise. You know, they mm-hmm. are legitimately going and eating Burger King, you know, Five this times is, a week. If Burger know, King is in front of you, if Burger King's in front of me, and that's the only food available. That's right. I'm going to eat it. You got to eat. And you, I totally you have know to better, eat. but right. there's food there, and I'm hungry. That's right. And it just happens. That's right. right. So yeah. I, I'm glad you said that because I, I really think that's the solution from my perspective is putting them in the right environment where making the right choice is the only choice. One hundred percent. Couldn't yeah. agree. If more. the wrong choice is available, it's going to happen. That's right. I agree. And most people are going to go with the wrong choice every time. Like Joe DeSena says, you know, he always takes the harder route. If he's got two choices, right, he picks the harder one because he knows that has to be the right one. And uh, <laughs> no, we're, that, he does it. He does it. That's, okay? we're 100%. Not no, he does it. 100%. And, um, and, you know, so that's kind of if you're given the two choices, if you're given the Burger King or the salad, the kid's going to take the Burger King every time, right? You know, so yeah, yeah let's out it. Yeah, the yeah. kid's not going to regulate himself. Uh, no, 100% or, or herself. No. CTP has something to say. I was going to say, and on that note, you got to, you know, big couch is going to hate me, but if you can't if you can't have the foods in the pantry that are going to make you fat, you can't have the couch. So let's get rid of the couches, right? Yeah. <laughs> Actually, uh, big couch. I was thinking about <laughs> <laughs> big couch. Are you talking about like a couch in your living room? No, like like, like big pharma, like big couch, like the couch industry, <laughs> big agra, right? So yeah, yeah. Big big so, sorry, Jordan, to keep you <laughs> big, big couch, <laughs> not big bean bags though. We all need big bean bags. Oh, right? let's yeah, not be crazy. Can't, man, that'd be insane. We, we need big bean bags. <laughs> oh man, my my favorite piece of furniture. Yeah, <laughs> no doubt, no doubt about it. All right, and, and so we're we're hanging out up in the barn. We're talking about uh, figuring out how to solve this problem, and then you and I are hanging back having a drink. And uh, I, was, I was telling you, I was like, I want to start a farm one day, you know, maybe three years from now. And I think the conversation ended as we will be starting a farm three years from now, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And uh, and you were you were saying, oh yeah, to be considered local, it's a four hundred mile radius, and we we're talking about maybe we could partner up in a way where we could like open up more farms in different places. That's right. So you know, everything has to be scalable if you want to. Um a, if you want to financially succeed, but if you want people to believe in you and, and to fund our project as well, right? So the scalable vision is here, and I don't even know if this is ever possible, but we've created like Sweet Georgia Peas Food Shed, right? With, which is that 400-mile that, that radius around our farm. Um, and now why can't you take that 400-mile circle and just plop it all over the country, yep. right? And I'm not even saying Sweet Georgia Peas, but small farmers, let's do it, right? If all of a sudden our small farms and our CSA radius is plopped all over the country, now that choice is available to mm. every child out there. Do you think right? that's, the only, so, that's the only way you can lose right now is because right now you aren't unified? If the small farmers get together, now you have the force that can balance out the other that's side. Right. That's right. And oh. we're, we're, we're quickly banding together This is like a right militia now. situation. We're going to put together a battle flag. We're going to fucking rally the troops and make something happen. That's right. And we, we have the Spartan militia behind us, so we can do it. Oh, yeah. So, oh, yeah. <laughs> it, it was my understanding when Starbucks was growing, and maybe this is still happening, that they wouldn't just plop Starbucks all over the country. They would they would move into a city, and they would just, like, take take over the city, like, one city at a time where, sure. like, you, they would put Starbucks, you know, in one location, and then one pretty close by, and then one pretty close to that, one pretty close to that, one pretty close to that, and they would kind of just cover the whole city until that was just the only obvious option because they blanketed the whole city, and everyone had a ton of awareness about Starbucks in that city and then they would move on to a new city. Sounds like and I don't even, risk. And I don't even know if that's true, <laughs> but but that that could be a potential a potentially good way to go about doing sustainable farms. Put them close to each other that way 
uh, you saturate that area as far as awareness goes. That's right. And right now, mm. like the coast, the northeast, and then California, you know, northern California and stuff, that's, that's kind of what what's happening, right? And it, it starts on the coast, and I think most things probably do start on the coast in this country, right? And, uh, and now we just got to kind of keep pushing forward. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, things do seem to start on the coast and kind this of move is, in. That's right. Yeah. What about cows? I know you have goats and chickens, and you do a, a variety of vegetables and whatnot. We, I, we, we have Angus cows, four Angus cows up on the uh, up on the hillside. Happy there. As fuck They're there. actually they look very happy. Up they there. are. Yeah, that's right. they're, they couldn't Until have a better one life. fateful day. One bad day, man. One bad. <laughs> what are you day. doing, that's Joe? It. That's <laughs> right. It's a thirty-minute ride, man. It's only a thirty-minute car ride. All right. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> there, there, girl. There. That's there. right. Hey, we are omnivores. We eat meat, right? So you may right. as well eat meat responsibly, people. Eat meat responsibly. Yeah. So how, so how does this here compare to, like, industrialized cow operations or whatever they're called? Um, like a food lot? So our... <laughs> oh, man. Uh, I can't... I, one I, is a, a hell on rather. earth, and the other one is a farm. <laughs> that's right. That's right. One is a disgusting pile of rubble. Um, so... Have you been to, like, a, like a Colorado big, like, like I have crazy never, feed no, lot? No. I've never toured. Well, don't go. I, I've driven I, by I them. Go. All you got to do is, like, I just crossed the country yep. uh, by truck and pulling my trailer behind me. And uh, I forget which state we were in, but yeah, we we drove by something that was obviously one of those CAFO operations where they just and basically what happens is a lot of uh, cattle are raised on farm and on grass or whatever, and that's how they live most of their life. And then the last five months of their life, they're shipped. They get all put in a truck. They get shipped to this something called a CAFO, and what they do is they just fatten them up with grains. They give them the food that makes you fat. So if you eat grains, you get fatter. If cows eat grains. Sometimes they use candy. They fatter. And here's the thing is what they do is they feed, and they even feed them uh, themselves. So the parts of the cow yeah. that are not uh, usable by us humans, like I, like I refuse to eat the hooves and the and the ears and all this stuff, right? What they do is they, they recycle that. They feed the cows to themselves. Oh, God. Uh, and we all Soylent know. Soylent green is people. Well, we all, we all <laughs> know. It's people. I mean, like. And we know can Classic. like human cannibals end up with strange diseases because they're eating other humans, right? Prions so in their fucking brain and stuff. There's the scariest there's something, diseases there are. There's something that happens with the cows as well. So they're feeding the cows themselves lots of grains, lots of corn. The reason they're getting the corn is because uh, we subsidize the corn industry and we have too much corn, like more corn than we can eat. So we just feed it the cows to fatten them up. When you get that really nice marbling. It's because we fed them. Corn. You know they'll feed them anything now. They'll so, they'll feed them fucking excess candy. There's uh, go Google that. Oh really? Come on. Like last year, I read an article the year before where they had corn. It was a tough oh, year for sheep. corn or something. A little bit of drought or something. So they started reaching to whatever they had. They started having like bulk can uh, candy shipments put into the feed, mixing it in. Like I'm not. I'm yeah, pretty, I'm, I have a 99 so, percent memory of that so article. What, yeah. what, en- what ends up happening is they this only this process only lasts five months because if it lasts any longer than five months, the cow dies. All right, and the and you ever see like oh these cows weren't given antibiotics or whatever. Well, what ends up happening in this environment is they have to pump them full of antibiotics because they don't they'll die. So the scientists have figured out a way to keep the cow alive for five months in with that diet in that environment. They keep them right before they die. They slaughter them and they feed them to you. Like they feed you sick meat is what there's is what you end up getting. Um, that's why you grass fed. That's right. Uh, in addition to that, if you go to one of these CAFOs, is you end up with uh, it's just it's just all dust. There's no grass. It's all dust. There's a lot of runoff. There's a lot of uh, pollution runoff. Cesspools. Yeah, and it is nasty. So anytime you're anytime you're not, um, and uh, Joel Salton talks about this. I don't know if you're familiar with him. He does a lot of sustainable farming uh, education, but it talks about like. Uh, Anytime you're farming just one thing, there's usually you have to ship a lot of stuff in, and then it creates a lot of pollution and it just kind of drains off. That's right. You're mining. You're not farming at that point. Right. You're mining, and it's not yeah. a mining operation. I was about to say that, right? Like, so cows really aren't our big thing, but we do the mm-hmm. beef Angus because they're preparing our fields for growing produce now, mm-hmm. right? So they're the whole permaculture design type. Of it's thing. a part of like the larger ecosystem that that's keeps right. the farm running. That's yeah, right. You're, so those you're cows, running an ecosystem here. That, that's yeah. exactly right. Yeah. That's exactly right. So to do the sustainable farming small scale, it's running an ecosystem. I think if you understand yeah. what you're being served now, like it, there's a time where you, you can't you can no longer just like pretend that steak that is pale red and fatty. You can't pretend that you don't know where that shit's coming from. I think every individual you got a you got a couple bucks in your pocket, you're going to buy your your meal. You got again. I think it comes down to what you said. You got to make the best decision you can make right then. Ask yourself, what am I supporting? 
when I put my five bucks down, should I put down seven or 10 or 15? The, I think that's even kind of a myth, right? Like I think if you really start paying attention to it, to it you're not going to be paying that much more mm. for eating the right way. You actually would probably be pretty surprised because you're not buying that $4 monster drink, right? You're dr- drinking a glass of yeah. tap water instead, right? So yeah. if you make these decisions, I really think at the end of the year, you'd be all right. On a weekly basis, you're still drinking the monster. You're buying the, you know, and then you're buying yeah, the it, protein. And you buy the grass. That's right. Steak, so, then so, so then, yeah, exactly. But it, so if you're supplementing with this stuff, then you're going to be spending more money. But if you actually switch your diet right. to the real, you know, eating real food primarily, uh, um, I think you're going to be That's really, awesome. really back, shocked. We go back to the lifestyle thing. That's right. Now, people always want to just dip their toe in being healthy. Right. It's like, no. And they'll do it for a week. They'll gotta, do it for a week. You got to go get, all in. You got to train. Get frustrated. You got to train. You got to change your lifestyle. How come I'm not no. healthy? Then they get frustrated. Yeah. Or strong Espe- or performing better. How come this, that, and the other? Especially if you start counting all the money you spend by just eating out. Yep. Absolutely. Like if, oh, if you include that as part of your grocery bill, right. then oh, if you didn't eat out anymore and you just ate you know, healthy meat and vegetables and- um, and maybe some fruits, nuts, seeds, that, that whole deal, and you weren't buying any more processed food, you weren't buying any more alcohol or beer, and you weren't eating out, and you didn't have a bar tab, kind of like we said earlier, then it's not that crazy expensive. You would probably save uh, money. And That's right. Back in the day, I did a budget, and I found out that I was spending more money on eating out than I was on groceries. Oh, but yeah. The majority That's of, common. But the majority uh, of my meals were at home. I'm like, oh. Yeah. Okay. Right. When you Economics do, you sit down 101. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And at a restaurant, they're probably serving I, you the cow that a, you don't want to eat. I'm a slow learner, folks, but I've learned there's a lot of other slow learners out there, so I'm here to help you. <laughs> right Form a militia of slow learners. <laughs> it took, took you a long time to learn there was a lot of slow learners. <laughs> <laughs> Proving you were a slow learner. <laughs> <laughs> at the age of 32, I've learned. There's a lot of dummies like me. <laughs> I've learned that. Um, what? <laughs> I think. So yeah. do, do you know enough about, about subsidies with, with corn and soybeans and all and all the, the kind of the big agriculture to, to talk about how that kind of developed and how that's affecting our food supply for uh, the whole country? Or is, or is that something that... That's not... Yeah, I would rather not get into a conversation. We'll bring, we'll bring like some <laughs> like, kind of like agricultural economics. Yeah, yeah. That, that's day. what you need. You need... Right. So so there's two type of farmers that are happening right now, right? So um, you have people like us that have just dove right in and learning it and learned it from square one, three goats, 25 chickens. And then you have uh, the whole slew of, of students that are coming out with ag degrees and stuff like that that have never put their hands in dirt. And those are the people you need to talk to to have that conversation. Those sons of bitches. Those sons of bitches. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's unbelievable. I don't, I don't know if they're a good thing or a bad thing, but uh, yeah, I think that any student going into an ag program should be work on a working for-profit farm um, for one year before they're allowed into that program because we have kids coming out of these programs now that come to work on the farm and they're like hey but i I don't want to be in the hoop house for six hours it's too hot in there you know and and, uh, that that probably goes for any industry that's right that's right yeah yeah, no doubt the chemicals (laughs) that's right (laughs) i don't see not the farmer mentality no No, lab at school had all these chemicals where are they i can't grow shit man i'm not prepared (laughs) Uh, i have eighty thousand dollars student loan debt what am i gonna do all right let's wrap this up Joe, if they want to find out more about your operation, where do they go? Uh, SweetGeorgiaP.com. So uh, it's just the letter P at the end. And you can find us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, all that good stuff. Follow and, these good and, people. And that's the, you know, that's the biggest thing. And to you know, spread the small farming movement throughout the United States, right? We just need the power of the social media and the help of you guys. And uh, it's really cool. I'm so happy to have you visiting the farm. Are there any other websites that you're familiar with that maybe like people can find? Uh, their local farm. Yeah, so I know the one in Vermont in the Northeast is Northeast Organic Farming Association, so nofa.com. Uh, Vermont Organic Farmers is another site, and there you could, I guarantee they have links yeah. all over the country uh, to find your small farms. You know, in, in the cities, they have, uh, like New York has Just Food, um, and they're, the, they're the kind of the intermediaries bringing all the CSAs down into New York. Um, yeah, just do a small amount of research on Google, and you will. I guarantee there's a local farm near you that you can support. Use the Googles, you dummies. Use the Google. <laughs> You'll figure Black it out. Black said the pot. <laughs> if you can't, if Google can't help you, nobody can. All right, make sure you go to barbellstruck.com, sign up for the newsletter, and we'll send you all the information that you can't find on Google. Thanks, Joe. To learn more about how you can support the show, go to barbellstruck.com and sign up for the newsletter.